choice of maturity. <clears throat> the choice of maturity. Let's look in, uh, at Hebrews chapter 6. And we're going to touch several verses in this this week and next week. And going to back up and go to Hebrews chapter 5 in a minute as well. <coughs> Sorry. I'm done choked up. Y'all done got me choked up. <clears throat> All right, Hebrews chapter 6. I'm at verse number 1. Let's read verse 1 through 3. <clears throat> Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washing and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to teach tonight. I thank you for this word, and I pray that it comes alive in my voice as it has in my spirit. I pray that you'd anoint me with an anointing to teach. I pray that you touch those in this room tonight, that they will receive the word, that all of us <clears throat> can begin to mature in who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name, and everybody said. Amen. As I teach on the process of maturing, um, let me be sure to say a, a few things to kind of start off in this beginning. There are certain elementary teachings that are essential to all believers. There's some things you never want to get away from. Um, there's, it's necessary to teach the basics. It's necessary to remind ourselves of the basics. And in our church, we've got to remember, whether it's in our sanctuary, whether it's in our Sunday school classes, everyone is not on the same level. So we've got to teach on many levels. We've got to, we have to remind people about the basics, and then we've got to try to stretch those that are deeper in the Word into somewhere else. Uh, you know, we're not like a university that has 100, 200, 300, 400 levels. We just have a group of people. So as teachers, we have to make sure that we're caref careful to kind of teach on all different levels to ensure that everyone is being fed. Let me give you... Uh, and I could probably list it 10 or 12 things, but I just want to give you six things real quick. Uh, what are some basics we should never lose? The importance of faith. Whether, and that's something we need to be reminded of. If you're a 50-year-old, mature, Holy Ghost-filled saint, you need to be reminded of the importance of faith. How to be saved. We should never stop reinforcing that. The foolishness of trying to be saved through good deeds. The meaning of spiritual gifts and how they operate. In a Pentecostal church, that ought to be a staple. We, that, that ought to be taught. That ought to be retaught. That ought to be a foundation that we build on so people can always know. That way, the, the, those that are mature can be reminded and those that are basic can begin to get the foundation. Eternal life. Let us not forget what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Let's also always the basic of prayer and the basic of Bible study. And we're going to actually going to dive into that tonight. Very, very important that those basics are never taught, are never not taught. They're always taught. It's important that we move beyond but not away from the elementary teachings. It's, it's important that as believers, as we begin to mature, we want to move beyond but not necessarily away from the elementary teachings we want to be more con have a, a, a more complete understanding of our faith. We want to have a greater grasp so that we can grow from concept and precept upon precept. And listen, here's a sign of maturity. We should eventually grow to where mature Christians are teaching the immature. One of the worries as a pastor that I have is that we have only a handful of teachers, and I'm not talking about those that can sit in a classroom, but we only have a handful of teachers that can teach new converts how to live right. And a church that has a hundred and some odd people on Sundays should have half the room that can teach somebody else the basics. You may not be able to teach the, the depths of, of some spiritual revelation, but you ought to be able to teach those basic principles. Our church ought to be full of mature people that begin to teach immature people so that those immature people can grow and begin to teach the new immature people. Amen? As the mature people begin to act on what they know, 
they will learn even more from God's Word. So a sign of maturity is stepping out on faith and beginning to put in action what you've read about, what you've heard about, what you've prayed about. Uh, sooner or later, when God continues to tell you, take a, take, take a step, take a step, take a step, sooner or later, you've got to say, okay, God, I'm going to activate my faith. I'm going to take a step. And when you do that, you now begin to have new revelation, and you begin to have more knowledge and more understanding. A lot of things won't line up until you take that step. And it's almost like a bunch of things that are, that are, that are zigzag lined up, and when you begin to pull it, it's straight to out into a straight line some things in your life will never begin to come into complete understanding until you begin to move in what God is teaching you so that everything else can get in line in your life it's a process of learning how to operate in what God is teaching you which causes you to grow in maturity and then another point have you ever noticed immature Christians how they will argue over points to prove that they're mature while showing their immaturity. I mean, you'll have an immature Christian just about cuss you out of the church trying to prove how mature they are, and you're like, eh, your actions have shown me how immature you are right now. So be careful, because as you begin to grow, you ought to begin to have a different perspective and a different behavior as well. Look at Rome, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. And this is something I've written down years, a couple of years ago, and I've rewritten it, and, and, and I'm finally going to say it. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. I was going to preach a whole message on this, but just a point tonight. For though by this time, everybody say, by this time, you ought to be teachers. By this time, You've been in this church 14 years. By this time, you ought to be teachers. Uh-oh. You've been operating in Rising. You're a founding member of Rising Phone. By this time, you ought to be teachers. Say amen. You, listen, get on to the right of Hebrews. We ain't sure who that person is. He stayed anonymous because he didn't want y'all chasing him down. All right. It says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles. You have come to need milk and not solid food. We don't understand why we keep having to feed you a bottle when you should be maturing in your walk with Christ. You ought to be strong enough now to be able to help a new convert. Can I pose a question that always causes me to stutter and it makes my heart to flutter? Is the lack of growth and the lack of converts in our church because we don't have enough mature Christians to train them? So we, God will only give us a little bit of growth because we can't handle a lot of immature Christians because we're not mature enough to take them by the hand and lead them on a walk of grace to get them into a place to where they can stand on their own. Oh. I, I, I'm just going to move on. I'm just going to let that simmer right there. Let's keep reading out of chapter 5. Let's look at verse 13. For every, and, and let's read 13 and 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. Let's just pause there. If you only drink the milk of grace, or the grace of milk, if you only start off and you never grow, then you can never handle the word. You will always find yourself moving to places that will pet you as a baby instead of grow you as an adult. You'll, you'll always leave churches that challenges your growth because you only want somebody to coddle you. Because you can't handle the word of righteousness. Once again, I'm just reading straight. I'm straight up reading the Bible. Verse 14 says, but solid food is for the mature. Who, because, watch this. Who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Solid food is for the mature. But did you notice a sign of maturity? They have practiced 
to control their senses. Let me not get ahead of myself. Sooner or later, we've got to begin to apply the word and the lessons so that the, the stacked blocks become the train that lengthens. And listen, the writer of this is talking to the Jewish people, the Jewish Christians, the Jewish converts. So here's what he's saying. Hey, you Jewish people, don't be afraid to move beyond your customs and your rituals and your traditions. Don't be afraid to give up what you were taught in synagogue to be able to figure out who you are in Christ. Now, I know we don't relate to that, but we can show relate to some old traditions. And we can show relate to some old school religious spirits that we, we will live under the control of old ways of church thinking. And I want to encourage you, as you mature, you're not afraid to give up old ways of thinking to learn who you are in Christ. You're not afraid to surrender old ways of, of doing so that you can learn who you are in Christ. But this means you have to move into the uncomfortable zone. None of us like to be uncomfortable. But if you're ever going to begin to mature, you will be faced with uncomfortable situations that will make you stronger and make you wiser. You have to be willing to get into uncomfortable. And in order to do that, you've got to stop trying to blend in with the culture. You cannot blend in with everything and every. You cannot be. What's those animals? I know lizards do it, but there's some other things. You know, if they're on something brown, they turn brown. And if they're on something green, they turn green. Camellias, is that right? They'll turn whatever. Listen, as a Christian, you've got to quit trying to blend into whatever you're in. And you've got to shine for Christ. And as you mature, you'll be, you'll be the bright object in a dark room. And you'll be a, a crazy neon object on a green leaf. Why? Because you are meant to stand out. You're not meant to blend into culture. Culture? Immature Christians try to fit in and blend into every social group. No, we're called to be separate. We're called to be chosen. We're called to be peculiar people. We're called to be salt. We're called to be light. So don't be afraid to get committed to Christ and allow him to move you into your destiny, into your purpose, and out of always being so relaxed. Uh-oh. This may be three or four weeks because I can't even get off this one page. Because I want you to think of something. If you're always relaxed and you're all, do you realize when you get uncomfortable you're now stimulated with new senses? I wonder if you would begin to feel alive again in Christ and you'd find purpose again in your life if you would get out of that, oh, I'm all so comfortable here, and you get a little uncomfortable, all of a sudden new things come alive in your spirit and new things are activated in your faith because you're now not trusting on the comfortable zone you've always in. You're now standing in a place you've never been, so now you're having to rely on faith like you've never... Re See, back here, when I'm all reclined and lonely, oh, I'm so comfortable, I don't have to rely on faith I don't even have to trust God because I'm but when I'm out here all by myself standing on the edge in a place I ain't never been before I don't know what turn is coming I don't know what's next I gotta have total dependency on Christ it's scary but it must happen little Sadie is gonna learn to drive she keeps on trying to tell me she ain't but I'm telling her she is I done told her I ain't hauling your tail around all the time when you're 16 you're gonna learn to drive and I know she's scared. And Lord, I shall be scared too that first, uh, uh, that whole first year. I still get scared riding with Belle. Amy told me just this last week, or maybe it was my daddy. No, my daddy told me, boy, Madison, who he scares me driving with him. Madison's 26, still don't know how to drive. <laughs> but if you don't overcome that fear of doing it, you never get the independence of doing it. Uh, let me move on because I, I really do have a lot tonight, but I really am watching the clock. Let's, let me give you what, what is needed to grow. I could have come up with a list so long tonight. I'm only going to give you five things. I could have given you ten. We could go around the room and everybody could add one at the end. So let me give you the five things you need to grow. Number one, and it, I'm taking this right off of chapter 5, verse 14. Learn 
discernment. Everybody say, learn discernment. The writer of Hebrews said in chapter four, uh, 5, verse 14, they have practiced and their senses trained. Their senses trained. They train their senses to discern good and evil. Train ourselves. Train your mind, your senses, our senses, our bodies to distinguish good from evil. Recognize temptation before it traps you. Learn to train your and discipline yourself to where, look, I know a lot of us fall in the middle of temptation going, oh, I didn't know this was going to get me. No, learn to recognize it. As you mature, you begin to control. You now discipline yourself to go, wait, 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 this something ain't right here. Let me control myself before I fall off in this pit. Let me control the senses that are drawing me. Let me control the urge to do it. Yeah, I got the urge, but I've got to discipline myself to go, I'm not going to do it. Anybody ever said this, I love Jesus too much to do that? So you've got to train yourself to whatever those vices are, and we all have them, that you can say, I can look back over my life since college and there are some traps that I didn't fall into not because my flesh wasn't going Whoa, or my mind going Whoa, but my spirit was going you love Jesus too much to be there or to do that and it was just a discipline did I re did have I has my flesh regretted it maybe but my spirit ain't never regretted it. I love Jesus too much to get caught in some of those things. But that comes from learning to discipline yourself. Learning discernment. Learn to discern the difference between correct use of scripture and wrong use. I'm going to say that again. And then I'm going to try not to go on a, on, a, on a long... When I was studying this, I wrote this yesterday... Uh, when I st was studying this today, I, I could have written a lot of new notes under this point. So I'm going to try not to go there tonight. Learn to tell the difference between correct use of Scripture and wrong use. Just because there's a multitude of people shouting the preacher down does not mean he's right. And just because he's a calm, deep-voiced theologian that is now rebuking everybody doesn't mean he's right. Because I, I, you know how you begin to scroll those little videos. I'll see one preacher just, his congregation shouting him down. I'm liking what I hear. And then the next video is a man in California who's rebuking that preacher because his congregation shouting him down. You can find, they both may be wrong. So you have to learn to discipline yourself to know the word to where you're not led by the emotion of a shout or the condemnation of a, of a man that speaks against it. Uh-oh. So I, I've, I've presented you a, a no-win clause. I can't shout nor can I. No, no, no. You, you can do both of those. You just have to discern what is right. And let me tell you something. Just because it makes me have feel-goodism doesn't mean it's right. Because I can get somebody to make, y'all know, I, love, I like listening to Joel Osteen when I'm a little sad. He ain't, never, he ain't never made me feel convicted. He always makes me feel encouraged. All, and that's what his ministry is. He tells you that. He's not, he doesn't try to hide that he wants to encourage people in his own words. People have enough trouble without coming to church and me piling more trouble on them. So he's an encourager. I can listen to him and be encouraged. I can, but that doesn't mean I want to let his teaching be my foundation. All right? I can hear some teachers that have some good stuff that I go, that's some good stuff. And then they'll say something, I'm like, hmm. Whew. So what do you do? You learn to spit out the seed and eat what's good? You ever bit into a, something you thought was going to be seedless and was, ooh, that ain't seedless at all? You don't swallow that because... That cherry had a seed and you didn't know it. I broke a tooth off one time because I was so happy to have a little piece of cherry on top of my ice cream. I didn't know people put seeded cherries in an in in ice cream. I bit down on that cherry and my tooth just went. Long, that's, that's another story. There's nothing there now but an empty space because that tooth finally just came on out. No, I had it pulled out. Anyway, 
So I may hear a preacher that my spirit goes, that one part I'm not sure about. And listen, and the reason is in the society we live in, we're only hearing clips of people. And when you only hear clips, listen, those people that are, that are denouncing every preacher that, listen, oh, help me, Jesus, I wasn't supposed to go here, I wasn't supposed to stay so long on this point, but I'm going to make it. Have you noticed that a lot of the preachers that some people are rebuking and debunking are Pentecostal people, people of faith? I don't know if you've noticed that. But it seems like everybody that believes in faith and believes in tongues and believes in the gifts of healing and believes in the prophecy, those people are getting debunked by a group of people and they'll take one sentence out of context and debunk a whole sermon. You're like, no, no, you can't debunk somebody on a one thing because you don't know the context leading into and following that. So be careful. So you learn to discipline yourself and you learn what the word is and pray that God gives you the discernment because you will never grow if you don't discern good and evil. You'll never grow if you can't discern, discern a right word and a wrong word. There was a preacher, and then I'm moving to point two. There's a preacher that I was uh, in prayer one night praying for him. And I, You ever prayed something and you're like, what they're coming from. I just started praying this, God, let them be clean. I don't know anything going on. God, and, and I have prayed, let them be, whatever it is, God, let them be clean. Let them be clean. I don't know what they're battling, but let them be clean. You may have preachers that the Spirit just kind of does something. You, you just beware. Beware. We've seen people that used to go to this church that got hooked up in Internet stuff. And boy, their mind got messed up. You can't listen to 15 different weird preachers and not be weird. You can't listen to one preacher that's preaching a, a hoax and another preacher preaching a, 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 a possibility and another preacher preaching some weird theological, because you become confused. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, if you're immature, you let me be your voice and let God get in your word, and then God teach you, and let me teach you, before you start branching out trying to learn from some guy you don't know nothing about. Amen. Amen. I, I must move on. Number two. Yeah, we ain't finishing this tonight. <laughs> Lesson one shall not be complete. The number, my wife's like shock. That's what I love about Wednesdays. I can just say, if I get stopped on point three, I just stop. Number two. Oh, and this is a good one. Be honest with your self-evaluation. Too often we want to eat God's banquet before we're spiritually able to digest it. Too often we want to eat God's banquet before we're spiritually able to digest it. As you grow, you add more depth to your study and you can handle much. Here's what happens. We begin to compare ourselves to what Amy's eating, and now I want to eat that, but you can't handle what she's eating. So instead of growing, you're regurgitating. You begin to throw up because you can't yet handle. So you're not getting any nourishment. You're not getting any strength. You're getting frail. You're getting weak because you keep vomiting up because you're not yet ready. You remember the first time you fed your baby that, that jar meat? Oh, no, let's not even think about that far. You remember the first time you fed them cereal, that, that oatmeal cereal junk, and how they just, and it just flows out like lava? Y'all remember that? That's what's happening to a lot of Christians. They, they don't want to self-evaluate and go, you know what, I'm not there yet, but I'm on the process of getting there. If you see Amy eating something you won't, don't condemn yourself because you can't eat it. Get on the path to grow to where you can get there. Because all of us have access into the same place, in the same word, in the same spirit. But you've got to be willing to mature to get there. Stop trying to live off of somebody else's meal if you can't handle it. Be honest where you are with Christ. Be honest. And then begin to take the steps you need to move into a place where you can handle more meat. And let me say this, and you're going to hear this repeated several times, um, well, now over the next couple of weeks. And don't condemn yourself if you try it and you throw up. Just go, oop, I thought I was ready. I better get me some, I better get me some insure because I can't handle this yet. 
I got to get some nutrients somewhere so, so I can't handle this thing. I better get me something that's going to give me some strength. Because what happens in the church world is we'll eat nothing or we'll eat everything. And you die either way. You've got to learn how to get on a path to where the word is now causing you to grow. Liam one day will be off his mama's milk. One day he'll start finally trying to eat something and it'll be more on him that's in him. But Caleb ain't going to let him waddle up to him at age two and he'd be strong and healthy off breast milk. She better not. But we expect him. I can't wait to be like Brother Richard say, let me give you your first ice cream cone behind your mama's back. You know, I can't wait for those steps to happen. But what happens be willing to take the steps in the process to get there. Let me go to another one. Uh, number three, cut some ties. Cut some ties. If you want to mature, there are people, there's places, and there's things you've got to be willing to let go of. If you keep hanging on to some of that old, those old friends and those old things, you'll never grow because you're still connected to something God's not going to allow in his presence. You're trying to bring something into a holy place while you're connected to an unholy thing, and God will not allow that. Only the holiest get into the holy place. Only the holy enter into the most holy place. You've got to cut the ties. Get, listen, you've got to say, ooh, to be able to have what God has for me, I am willing to let go of this. I won't ever forget, I was 16 and the Lord told me to stop listening to secular music. And that was before there was Christian radio on satellites and, and on every town had a southern gospel and contemporary. Back in those days, you couldn't even find Christian music. And I was like, oh, my, okay, God. Listen, God told me, when I first got saved, he said it. I just did it. I didn't even question. I hope I'm still that way. But, you know, my point was I was, yes, God, yes, God, I'll do it. You told me to jump off the building. Catch me now, God. Catch me now, God. So when he told me to give it up, I mean, I gave it all up. I didn't listen. I stopped listening to Lionel Richie. I stopped listening to, I can't even think of nobody else. That's only Lionel Richie because I used to truly I, I just I saw all that had because for whatever reason and, and listen that went on for years I now will sprinkle in a little bit of stuff but still not a lot now but I'm at the age now I enjoy talk radio more than I do music so I'm sorry about that but and I knew that if God was going to allow me to grow I had to show that I would be faithful in giving up whatever he told me to give up back in the old church ladies gave up wearing pants Y'all don't, nobody even nodded. Everybody's just like, well, I was going to write notes, but I have stopped writing notes now. <laughs> yeah, uh, no notes to <laughs> But y'all remember back in the old days, ladies wouldn't, they, they wouldn't shave their legs because they thought they was going to be closer to Jesus. He likes when you shave your legs. <laughs> but that was the old church because they, it was vain to shave your legs. You, and, then, you know, I was talking to an apostolic friend yesterday, and I said, uh, we was talking about the higher the hair, the, the closer to Jesus. And, and he says, yeah, that's what, that's what my wife lives by, you know, because she has big hair, a lot, a lot of hair. And I, and I thought to myself, and he gets his shaved almost. So in the apostolic, the men got all the hair cut off, and the ladies just let it grow. But they were willing to do whatever it took to get to Christ. And believe it or not, some men made rules that didn't get them closer to Christ. But watch what I'm about to say. But God honored them because they were faithful, because their desire was, God, I don't care. I just got to get to you. Ooh. I ain't trying to tell you to grow your hair out. The next thing, undercut some ties. There's some relationships that need to be rearranged in your life. You have too much stake in some relationships. You have some relationships that are major that only need to be minor. You have some people in your life, let them be in your life, but don't let them control your life. So you, if you're going to mature in Christ, you've got to be able to rearrange relationships and put them in the proper perspective. And I'm about to say something that's going to make all of us uncomfortable. That means if your kids are out of, out of the perspective of where they belong in your relationship, 
If you're worshiping your kids more than your God, they're in the wrong place. Now, Amy has to, con- this is what Amy has to control. If you're worshiping your husband almost more than you're worshiping your God, then your husband's in the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> There are things that we think are so good and we'll pour into and pour into and pour into and we're wondering why we're not maturing. It's because we are pouring into the wrong people. How can I pour into the wrong person? Because that person is not meant for you to pour into. They're not your assignment. Uh, Everybody is not your assignment. You're not called to fix every broken person in your family. You're not called to fix and manipulate everybody to get in line with what you think they ought to be. You take care of you first, and then God will strategically put people in your life that you can grow with you. How can you cause somebody else to grow when you're not strong enough to walk yourself? If you're not strong enough to carry your burden and somebody else's, why would God give you somebody else's? I will say that again. If you're not strong enough to carry your burden and somebody else's, I don't think God's going to give you somebody else's burden. Once you prove you can carry your weight, then God will try you with a weight that won't break you, but a weight that will challenge you. Some of you need to rearrange some relationships and go, who I can't handle that weight in my life right now. It's keeping me from maturing. I find myself more aggravated, more frustrated. My time is more restricted because I'm pouring into somebody who's still so broken, all of it's spilling on the ground. Y'all with me? I'm about to stop. I got to remember where I'm at. Let me just, I'm going to end with this one. Addictions need to be released. Addictions need to be released. Let me get a pen so I can mark where I'm at for next week. Addictions are not just, I think we sometimes think of addictions as I drink too much, I have addictions to nicotine, I dip too much, I'm addicted to pornography, that kind of stuff. But addictions can just be things of the mind that you don't have under control. And if you're going to grow, you've got to let those physical addictions go and you've got to let those mental addictions go. And I'm going to use something that I hadn't even ever thought of. There's some spiritual addictions that aren't healthy for you as well. And I'm not talking about spiritual meaning I'm in God. I'm talking about there's some things in the world you're, you're addicted to spiritually that God is saying, come on, let me grow you. You have to be able to release your addictions. And I'm going to say this. I read this in a book, and I would tell you what book, but I don't remember. Yes, I do. It's uh, Making a Warrior. It's a men's ministry book about becoming, raising, teaching men to become warriors. And he made this comment. And I'm going to, I've taken it in my mind and I've rearranged it out of context. Quit investing your thoughts into things that do not need to be invested in. Let me, for example, if I see a woman that attracts my attention, why should I invest my thoughts into her when I can invest my thoughts into my wife? If you are, see, my mind is, I, I can daydream. I can win. I don't play the lottery, uh, but I can win the HGTV dream home and take the cash instead of the house. And in my mind, I can tell you what I'm going to buy, what I'm going to pay off, what I'm going to fix. In my mind, I can tell you how much I'm going to give to the church because I done read the fine print. I know, I know exactly how much money I'm going to win. I know what I'm, I've already got my taxes figured out. I got to pay this much to federal. I mean, I got it all worked out. Why am I investing in something so foolish? When I ain't even one in 10 trillion chances. Now, I may win it this year, praise God. And I'm a little prepared on what I'm going to do with the money. But isn't that, aren't you investing your mind into things when you could be investing it in thought, thinking on good things, things that are lovely, things that are pleasant, things that are praiseworthy? Stop investing your mind in addictions when God wants to free you. Some, oh, some, and, and I'm trying to figure out how to stop. Some of us invest in such immaturity that we can never mature. Because our thoughts are so invested 
in childhood things. And I don't mean teeter-totters. I mean spiritually childhood things. Or then we daydream. I'm going to close my book so I know I have to stop. Or then we daydream about things not have visions of. I'm talking about crazy fantasy daydreams. That the only way you'll ever even have a chance of that is if you discipline your mind to be able to work the process, to be able to mature to the point to where God can trust you with that fantasy or trust you with that daydream. And I'm using the wrong words, and I apologize for that. You better stand because it's time to go. So this has just turned into a three-week project. Praise the Lord. I just want us to mature, don't you?